All right, friends, welcome back to the Blessed Family Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Jared Dodd. Very excited to be here with a very special guest, a dear brother of mine. Uh, it's funny because I say dear, but we've only met <laughs> once uh, and even less than a year ago, but it was one of those just uh, connections that you you just know that God's got something planned out. Uh, friends, this is Pastor Adam Pullman. Uh, he serves as pastor of Redemption City Church, which he helped plan about seven years ago. He and his wife have been married for 18 years, praise God for that, and have six beautiful children, saw a picture of his family, and I've met, I think, all of them, uh, but <laughs> just just a, just a beautiful family. And uh, Adam has a vision for planning ordinary churches in Southern Minnesota, which I'm really excited about because I have a vision for planning churches in Central Texas, and it's cold in Minnesota, <laughs> and I don't want to be up there planting churches, uh, but actually, th this this guy is our local ministry of planting churches is a drop in the bucket. I, I've got so much to learn from this man. Uh, and so just as a way of introduction, as you all know, here at the Blessed Family, we understand and talk often about the connection between family and church, right? And so um, healthy healthy churches are made up of healthy families. I'm sure uh, Pastor Adam can testify that the best thing for his church would be a gathering of health of healthy families, but we're going to focus on uh, a few of our podcasts and, and it might not all come at once, but it'll be spread out a bit, but on just rethinking church in light of God's word. And uh, we have some great questions to answer. So Adam, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Thank you. It's been a delight to get to know you and God is funny sometimes in his sovereignty to connect people and change your life in a direction you never thought it could go. Yeah. Amen, brother. Now, when I first met you, you had a beard like mine, like more of a clean. Yeah. And now it's 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 definitely manlier. So I well, think you're winning the competition. Not that there is one, but if there was, you'd be winning. Once I started losing hair on top, I had to have it somewhere. So I let it go here. And mostly my beard gets long when I get uh, lazy and don't want to spend time shaving. Well, so, dude, it's funny it you say that because I have the same plan and I'm only a couple of years behind you, man. This is going pretty quick. So you'd look good, Bob. All right. All right. I, I, I'm going to tell my wife you said that. I like that. <laughs> all right. So uh, let me just give our listeners. We have four podcasts planned and I want to give them the topics of each and then we'll jump into today. So the first one today, we're yeah. going to talk about defining a church. What is a church? Which that's yeah. going to be awesome. Uh, next, we're going to talk about church offices which is leadership in church, which is a great topic because there's so many different ideas. Excited about that one. Uh, third, the church's mission. What are we supposed to be doing? Why are we a church? What are we supposed to be accomplishing for the glory of God? And lastly, church practices, which should be covenants and sacraments. Folks, this is a lot of great, great content coming your way. So I hope that you take advantage of it. So let's uh, jump in and talk about uh, defining a church. So Couple of questions. Uh, first of all, why is it important to rightly define a church? And after you speak about that a bit, go into where do we start? Yeah, man. Take it away. Uh, this is actually as much as I love talking about family and and farming and sports and all kinds of things. Uh, defining a church seems to be one of the things that is really sticky for at least people in Minnesota, perhaps people in Texas and around the country and around the world too, as uh, when we hear the word church, we define it, we have all kinds of assumptions uh, that I don't think we're all, are all very biblical and maybe have good intentions or maybe tangentially related to the Bible, but uh I want to make sure that we start with the core principles of what is a church, because I hear people say things to me all the time, like I'm going to church, like it's a place you visit, or we're, we're having a Bible study at the church, like it's a building, or I'm out there being the church. Uh, and th those things might have some elements of truth to them, but, uh, I don't think they get at the core identity of what a church is. Um, and then we start we start gathering ourselves together over wrong ideas because we don't have the, the right focus of what we are called to be. So I really want to do a good job of defining what a church is. Start there and then start adding all the other things on top of it. And it's super important because... 
throughout scripture, especially in the New Testament, uh, there is some lofty language for what we are called to be and do when when Jesus and his apostles uh, call us to be a church. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 3.10 that the manifold wisdom of God is put on display in the world through the church. Uh, in John 13, Jesus says, they will know you, you are my disciples by your love for one another, not by your mercy ministries or your close affinities and other things or your love for homesteading or the style of music you like or whether you wear cowboy boots or not. He says, by your love for one another. In John 17, he even like just blows this whole thing up even more saying that this unity that we have is a reflection of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit for all eternity, completely satisfied in themselves, uh, in himself, however we, we rightly say that. But Father, Son, and Spirit have always just been so perfectly satisfied. Three persons, yet you can never tell them apart because they're always one. They're always working together. So we want to delight in our differences, not unify around our preferences, but unify around Christ. Uh, Paul says that in Ephesians 4, that some gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to all to give to the church so that each part of the body can be built up in its own function, in its in its uh, skills, in its giftings, to so that the body can build itself up into the maturity of Christ. He's the unity that we're striving for. Uh, Paul even writes to Timothy, this this young pastor at the in the church at Ephesus, tells him. I'm writing these things to you right after he explains all the stuff about what elders and deacons should be, what their character should be. And then he's going to explain, what do you do with widows? What do you do with wayward people, divisive people, all this stuff? He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you can be a church, the pillar and buttress of the truth. I want you to organize the church in the right way so you can be this display of God's love towards the world through all these crazy different people unified as one and doing all the things he calls us to. So I want to make sure we get these things down right. And so where do we go to find how we do that? Uh, there's all kinds of gurus that supposedly know what a church ought to be. I just won a $200 gift card to a denominational bookstore. And I'm like, great, I want to go find some good solid doctrine that can help me teach what a church is. And they have all kinds of light and fluffy book studies. And I'm like, ah, this just, this is man's wisdom. I want to know what does God say about what we are called to do? So I like to run to not, I, I gave a bunch of Bible verses from the new Testament, but what I like to do is actually say, God started defining his church, his people, right there in Genesis 1. The way I love to teach the Bible is to say, every every question anyone ever asks me, where do you see this? How is How do we do that? What is this supposed to be? What is this in the Bible? Let's open up to Genesis chapter 1. So, so bro, what you just said is extremely revolutionary in today's church, in my strong opinion, because uh, when it comes to church. I mean, what do we think about? We think of New Testament. I mean, people even say we're a New Testament, which I mean, we are the New Testament, the, the church of the new covenant. Amen. Yeah. And yet, and yet very often we're quote unquote, New Testament Christians. And uh, the idea of defining church starting in Genesis, first of all, starting in the Old Testament, most people wouldn't even consider church in the Old Testament. Yeah. But to say defining the church starting in Genesis and Genesis chapter one, that's pretty awesome. So, all right, man, you've uh, got me hooked. I'm ready. So I like to think of church as not just, I, I want to get rid of all these images of a building or or a bunch of people with their hands in the air singing. Uh, really, the whole idea of church comes from the beginning of God working to gather for himself a people to represent him, to praise him, to reflect his glory into the world. And so you see that right in the beginning, 
in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is this special place that has God's presence, and there's a community there of Adam and Eve. As long as there's two, then you have a community. Jumping ahead a little bit to the New Testament, but you have this community. As long as God is there with a diversity of people who are focused on him, you've got his people. Now, it doesn't use the word church yet. Similarly, you look at the Garden of Eden, you can find aspects of it being a temple. It's on a mountain. The rivers are flowing out. God's presence is there. There's a door that is guarded by the angels, all these really cool things. So we're seeing sort of the, the foundation of what the church is right there in the Garden of Eden. And then obviously they're kicked out. They sin. They can't be in God's presence but god still wants to fill the earth he told them be fruitful multiply fill the earth subdue it have dominion over it bring this whole planet into my presence make it this community of humanity that dwells with me well they failed at that they're kicked out there's angels at the front door uh, that say you can't come in here sin is not allowed into the community so God says, but I, this is still my plan. This isn't plan B. You haven't, Satan has not thwarted my plan. I will have my people fill the earth. So he makes these promises that one day, one of the seeds, uh, the seed of the woman is going to restore the community into fellowship with God. Later on, we see Noah, a few chapters later, he's called into this ark. God shuts the door and God is there in the ark with the family, eight people. Now it's a new community with God. There's boundaries. There's all kinds of definitions about who's in and who's out. Those who are on the outside are being judged. Those who are in the inside are being protected and cared for. So we're just we're getting a little bit more of this picture of what's happening. Well, you, you you're led to think that maybe maybe Noah is this guy who is the seed that was promised to Eve. And then he gets off the boat and, of course, does some foolish things and proves this guy's not it. But God's still not done with his promises. He wants his community. He wants his people. And so he calls this man named Abram out of a pagan moon-worshipping land and says, you, I'm going to start this whole plan over with you. Calls him to the promised land. Incredibly, it's really cool how he calls him from the east. If you ever pay attention to directions in the Bible, you'll see that uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden to the east and, and people settled in the east. The east suggests being far from God, being separated from God, being out of fellowship with God. So Abram being called out of the east and he's given this promised land, this beautiful land that sounds very garden-like. It sounds like Abraham is or Abram, is coming back into the garden fellowship with God. And God makes these promises. I'm going to create a nation out of you, a community of diverse people who are unified under my authority. And then that gets more specific with Israel. They're exiled again to Egypt. And they come, God calls them out of Egypt. They come through this water. They go into the, the land. And if you ever think about why in the world did they come out of Egypt and not just go straight northeast into Israel. Why did they why did they come all the way around and come in across the Jordan from the east side? Because they had to come out of of wandering from the east apart from God's presence into the presence of God in the land. And there they were to be a community given 613 laws about community life, but these are the people where he got God said, I will dwell with you if you remain in my community. And you see, even now we're getting a little more clarity once we get to Israel. Uh, the word that we translate church in the New Testament in Greek is ekklesia. And the the Jews, when they when Alexander the Great kind of took over the, the region and he made everybody speak Greek, the Jews made a Greek translation of the Old Testament before, before Jesus came. So we had a Greek translation of all of this stuff that happened. And the Greek word that they would use for these gatherings of Israel at the foot of the mountain is the same word, ecclesia, church. Or, or in Hebrew, it's kahal. It's these people who are called out 
to come into the presence of God and be his community. And right. so there's this longing for this to happen that just isn't. And then you see at the end, they're, they're exiled. They're taken to Babylon. We're like, are we ever going to have this thriving community of people with God? All right, guys. So got to give you some observations. This is, this is a great discourse uh, that we're getting here. The question put on the table was not um, give us an overview of Old Testament history. The question is, what's a church? And most answers would be, well, you know, I mean, over at the church of what's happening now, we just got our 501c3 and we're da da da. And yeah. what I love about this is our brother is rightly defining the understanding of the called out ones, ecclesia, from cover to cover. Well, he's not through yet, but he's got his halfway <laughs> cover to cover through this through this amazing book. And so what I want to challenge the our listeners with is, and this is a challenge to myself as well, if we're going to rightly understand this, this amazing thing we call church, which is to be the bride of Christ, which, which Christ said, I'm going to build this church and it's going to break down the gates of Hades. If we're going to rightly understand this, we have to rightly understand scripture and the story of scripture from cover to cover that God, oh, and, and, and see also what this points out is it sounds to me, Adam, like God had a plan this whole time. Yeah, never has he been thwarted. This has never been, oh man, Adam failed me. Oh man, Noah failed me. Oh man, Abraham failed me. Oh, Moses and Israel, they keep failing. Oh, and, and I finally brought them back to the land and now the priests are failing me again. No, oh, what are we going to do? No, it's always, it's been clarifying, drawing us each step of the way closer and closer to the fulfillment that was always planned. And there's hints of that throughout. There was a seed, an offspring promised to Eve. There was a son, a seed promised to Abraham, a son promised to David, uh, a new heavens and a new earth, a new temple, a new, a new nation. All of these things were expected, but nobody could figure out how. And then Jesus comes along. And I love in the beginning of, of Matthew, it's it's the first gospel. And I think I think the Jewish apostles put Matthew right there at the front to say, Matthew is trying to be most clear that he is the fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Jewish promises for the Messiah, for the seed, the offspring, the king. And uh, he goes up to John the Baptist in Matthew chapter three to get baptized. And John the Baptist says, I, wait, uh, I don't need to baptize you. You should be baptizing me because he's thinking, I, I'm the sinner. I need to be cleansed. And Jesus says, no, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. And John says, oh, okay. And he just does it. And we modern readers go, that doesn't make any sense I just, to fulfill all righteousness. Where was, where does it say in the old Testament that the Messiah needed to get baptized? If we're asking that question, we're revealing that we're not reading scripture the way that the apostles read scripture. They see these stories that are unfolding and Jesus being the, the ultimate character that's that each of those stories is pointing to. And he's reliving all of those stories. He's the new Adam. He's the new Noah. He's the new Abraham. He's the new Moses, the new Israel. He's the new priesthood. He's all of these things. So, and he even says that the whole, everything has come to be fulfilled in me. I'm not, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. That, that means a lot of things, but at minimum, it just means they were all talking about me, leading to me. After his resurrection in Luke 24, Jesus is walking with the guys on the road to Emmaus and they don't even recognize him. And then finally they see him. What? You're alive? This is crazy. And he says, why are you surprised? You should have known that this was coming. And he, it says, Luke says, he opened the scriptures to show them how all these things were said about him in the law and the prophets in Luke 24. In John 35, he's arguing with the Pharisees and they're like, but we've got Moses. And he says, if you listen to Moses, you would know about me because Moses wrote about me. Paul argues from the scriptures in the book of Acts I are, that all of this is about Jesus. So now we see that Jesus is actually himself the fulfillment he is israel he's a new adam and all these things that were promised in the old testament 
are now fulfilled in him. Paul says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So now he's the one who is given the command to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. He's the one that's going to become a great nation. He's the one that's going to fulfill all the law and restore all the people. So if you are in him, now you are part of this new community, this new nation, this new priesthood, this new uh, uh, royal authority, all of the things that Israel was supposed to be. Now Christ is, and we are in him. And all of that means we are a church. That's what it means to be a church. Dude, I have, I have never, ever thought about Jesus as the second Adam getting the same commission Adam had in Genesis 1, to be fruitful and multiply. I've never thought about that before. That is, It's kind awesome. of funny to think, like, we sing at Christmas time, he's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting, everlasting father. father. Yeah. Wait, but he's the son. Well, he's the son of the eternal father, but he's the father of a new humanity. Mm-hmm. That's and awesome. We are going to fill the earth. You know, this is but, this is probably probably one of the most beautiful uh, connections that Christians need to see between the Old and New Testament, the Old and New Covenant, is that every, like you mentioned, everything that's, I don't know how to say it better, cool and meaningful in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. Once again, he is the second Adam. He yeah. is the ark. Uh, he is he is the the uh, king now sitting on the throne of David. That's why he calls him the son of David. And we just missed yeah. that today. I, I I can remember, I think it's in Thessalonians um, or maybe Timothy. Paul says, this is my gospel. And he says two things. He says that Jesus is raised from the dead and that he's descended from David. And we're like, descended from David? What does that have to do with anything? But yeah. that's, that's, that's the good news is uh, he isn't just savior, he's king. And he yeah. is the, uh, well, he is the lamb of God. So, you know, we had this sacrificial system. We had the Passover lamb. He is the lamb of God. So every, every this is why we need to know our Old Testaments, right? Because Amen. every powerful, beautiful story there gives us insight into our Lord, into our King and into our purpose. So that's yeah. awesome. And so it doesn't just stop with Jesus. Now we see Jesus in Matthew 16, talking to Peter on this, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he says, says very similar things in Matthew 18. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you guys go. There, there's this transition, this, this passing of authority. It's my authority as the king of the universe. And I'm granting some of that authority to my new community of people, to be that nation, to be that kingdom of priests. And the apostles are picking up on all this language. Uh, Peter says we're a royal priesthood. Paul says we're ambassadors of for Christ. We are now in a new covenant with this new king. And we, we gather together for edification, for mutual uh, building up one another, caring for one another, serving together showing how we submit to King Jesus, practicing what it means to be a priesthood, to be a family, to be a body, to be the bride of Christ. All these images are just gathering from the Old Testament what Israel was supposed to be and say, now we can be that in Christ. Dude, that's that's awesome, man. So <clears throat> so to, uh, to understand the church, you have to understand the Old Testament. You have to understand the promises that were given. You have to understand these different epochs where, where, where God was yeah. progressively building our understanding. Now we have, you know, they looked forward trying to figure it out. We can now look back. Yeah, man. And so we can see it clearly. Hey, really quick, Adam, I want to let you know, Zoom must have some anti-biblical preaching software because <laughs> it just told us we have six minutes. So yeah. it's just feeling the power of this and it doesn't want, you know, the uh, world to see how, how, how awesome it is. So, okay. You got six minutes and three seconds, man. And don't worry, I'll give you a 60 second countdown. This is sure. good. Keep going. Yeah. So maybe just to wrap it up, uh, throughout church history, we can see some of these things were forgotten or even perverted, twisted into something else. And the church 
started off really well and they grew and became super influential and then they got interested in a lot of other things so you see now 1500 years later when the reformers come along they're like hold on this thing has become a leviathan a behemoth it's huge and i don't think this is what jesus meant the church to be so they come back and they say they look at the bible in this same way and say how should we define a church and and they come up with basically three things whether they're reformers in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, England, uh, France, they all have these same ideas of a church today is a gathering. The word ecclesia means gathering. So you're only a church if you gather. You're not a church organization. You're a church when you gather and you, you are knit together as one. And you're knit together by the right preaching of the word the gospel, you get the gospel, right? The death and resurrection of Jesus is the death of the old creation and the birth of a new creation. Uh, And the right administration of the sacraments. These are the signs that say who's in and who's out of the covenant. And, And then the third part is exercise of accountability and discipline, or what we today call membership. Saying, hey, we have a responsibility to hold each other accountable to what Jesus did for us and what we're supposed to be doing in him under his authority. So right preaching of the gospel, right administration of the sacraments, exercising accountability towards one another, even to the point of discipline of having to remove someone from the fellowship. That's what it means to be a church. And everything else then is a distraction. It's not that everything we do as churches is sinful, but it's really just, it's a distraction we have all these ministries, all these programs, all these activities that that move our eyes away from these central core identities of being in Christ, his body, his priesthood, his family, his bride, and practicing the things he's told us to practice. Preach the word, practice the sacraments, hold each other accountable. We should focus on doing those things first before we start adding on all the other activities. Man, okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me just uh, break this down for our listeners, because this is huge. So what Pastor Adam is saying, which I personally completely agree with, is these are the three marks of a church, right? They have the preaching of God's word, the preaching of the gospel. And let's just humbly look at where we're at in America today with that. And, 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 And that could raise some concern. There's, there's, there's definitely some churches churches that gather that are missing that qualification. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we are very anemic. Yeah. So gospel, and then we need the right practice of the sacraments, which as Protestants would be baptism and the Lord's supper. And um, we're going to be talking about those in an upcoming episode, but those are something that modern church doesn't really focus on maybe as much as it should. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, these are all equally important, but this is just a huge one is church leadership. Um, yeah. Is there accountability? And that's such an important word. Well, discipline also. I mean, church discipline, I would guess 90% of Christians, if you said those two words together, church discipline would scratch their head and say, what are you talking about? Is this for our kids in Sunday school class? And if they yeah. get out of line, they, you know, get in a timeout. And, and uh, just 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 something I want to challenge us with. Very often I'll talk to Christians, wonderful Christian people, and I love talking about church. It's my second favorite topic behind family. Mm-hmm. And uh they'll start we are uh, a family. Yeah. And they'll uh they'll uh, talk about uh their 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 pastor. And very often the pastor is a great teacher. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but he's not shepherding. He's just someone they listen to. There's not a relationship. Right, where there's where there's where there's accountability, which we've got a whole talk on that also. Um, okay, so we have a minute and twenty seconds left. Um, closing closing definition and encouragement to our listeners. Yeah, I I love this definition of a church. It's a it's a helpful modern summary of everything we just talked about. The local church is the regular assembly of Christians who have covenanted together to prize the gospel, preach the gospel, portray the gospel. So preaching, right? Preaching of the word, portraying the gospel through the sacraments and protecting the gospel through discipline and accountability. So the local church is the regular assembly of Christians 
who have covenanted together to prize the gospel, preach the gospel, portray the gospel, and protect the gospel. And we focus on the way Jesus told us to do that. That's our witness. That is the manifold wisdom of God putting on dis- put on display through the church. That's it. Just ordinary people coming together to worship and proclaim and protect and portray the gospel. And that's how he's going to fill the earth with his glory. Love it. Adam, thank you so much, friends. I hope you enjoyed this. Stick around. We've got more of Adam Pullman coming with us. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.